Welcome everyone to another seminar of physics and high energy physics at Physics Latin. Today we are very happy to have Professor Lothar Goshe. He is currently professor at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. After studying mathematics at the University of Kiel, he received his PhD on the direction of Friedrich Hiserbruch at the University of Bonn in 97. In 99. His field of research is algebraic geometry, in particular, he is interested in modelized spaces and numerical invariants of modelized spaces or defined via modelized spaces. This includes Hilbert schemes, modelized spaces of schemes, uh, modelized spaces of chiefs and vector bundles, uh, Donaldson invariants, modelized spaces of curves, Gromo Witten invariants, and numerative geometry of curves. Gauche received international claim for his formula for the generating function of the Betty numbers of the Hilbert schemes of points on an algebraic surface. He is also author of a celebrated conjecture predicting the number of cores in certain linear systems on algebraic surfaces. He is author of several influential works in algebraic geometry and also author of two books called Hilbert Schemes of Zero-Dimensional Subschemes of Smooth Varieties, and another one called Fundamental Algebraic Geometry, Gottendrick FGA Explained. He has several series of, of offline lectures at ICTP covering courses like Algebraic Geometry and Abstract Algebra, and many others that you can check on YouTube. It is an honor to have him with us today, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I'm going to talk about Hilbert schemes of points on surfaces. So I have to tell you what these are and uh, what they're good for. So let me, um, oops, we start. So we, <clears throat> we will work over an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. And whenever I find this useful, I take it to be the complex numbers. And S will be a smooth projective surface. Uh, the Hilbert scheme of n points on S, Hilbert and S, parametrizes zero dimensional uh, subschemes of length n on S. So that means a general point of the Hilbert scheme corresponds to, n to a set of n distinct points on S, but these points could come together and then uh, this Hilbert scheme parametrizes the corresponding non-reduced scheme structure. So, <clears throat> so this uh, Hilbert scheme of points on a surface is a special case of the general uh, Hilbert scheme. So for any projective scheme, there is the Hilbert scheme, which parametrizes all subschemes of this projective scheme. It has many components, and for a surface, one of them will be uh, the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S. And uh, the Hilbert scheme and its uh, generalization, the quad scheme, is uh, one of the main sources of uh, moduli spaces in algebraic geometry. So most moduli spaces are either Hilbert schemes or somehow obtained, uh, or quad schemes, or obtained from them via some kind of GIT quotient construction. Okay, so <clears throat> this Hilbert scheme of points on a smooth surface will actually be smooth and projective of dimension 2n if we take a risk of n points, and it will be a resolution of singularities of the symmetric power, the n symmetric power of the surface. I will explain that a bit better in a moment. So why should one care about this Hilbert scheme? So for one thing, it is a particularly simple and concrete example of modelized spaces where one can somehow really put one's hand on the modelized space and understand it quite well. And uh, many results one might want to prove about modelized spaces, one can uh, study first in the case of Hilbert schemes, and one can get some kind of model of what one wants to be true and what one wants to study. And so this is the first. Then <clears throat> many uh, modelized spaces are somehow built in terms of Hilbert schemes of points, or uh, they are related to Hilbert schemes of points, so one can use these Hilbert schemes of points to study these modular spaces and compute their invariants. And uh, <clears throat> Hilbert schemes of points are also important examples of higher dimensional varieties. For instance, if our surface is a K3 surface, so like a quartic surface in P3, 
then the Hilbert scheme of endpoints is a hyperkähler manifold or a holomorphic uh, symplectic manifold. And these are very rare and very special varieties which uh, have some very nice properties, uh, <clears throat> which one uh, you know, which one might want to study. So <clears throat> then as this thing parameterizes uh, sets of points or subschemes, uh, it has enumerative applications. For instance, counting point configurations and special positions, but one can also use it in indirect way to for other enumerative applications. For instance, also for counting curves uh, <clears throat> and also some other things. So, in this talk, I will first give some kind of informal introduction to the Hilbert scheme, uh, and given uh, then I give a more uh, uh, more precise introduction to Hilbert schemes and the functor of points and some uh, some results about them. And then uh, there's a change of gear. Uh, I, then I will just give um, an overview of uh, a number of results and applications of Hilbert schemes, each uh, a little bit of a sketch. And uh, so you can see you know, what they're good for and what the results are without having uh, detailed proofs. <clears throat> Oh, without having any proofs, um, and maybe even without uh, precisely always knowing, uh, I mean, me precisely explaining what I'm precisely talking about. But uh, you can get some kind of overview, and you can also see some of the techniques that are uh, standard to to, uh, to work with them and study. Okay, so let me start first with the informal introduction. So <clears throat> assume we want to parameterize sets of endpoints on the variety X, uh, where these points are allowed to somehow coincide. So we have endpoints counting this, uh, counted with multiplicities. So the simplest way of doing that is to look at the semantic power, uh, sum n X. So this is just the, we take the endfold product of X <coughs> and we divide it by the action of the semantic group, which uh, permutes the factors. Um, <coughs> So as a set, uh, then sum n x will be just you know n points counted uh, with multiplicities. So that means I could view that as a, a formal sum n one p one until n r p r, where the n i are some positive integers, um, the p i are some distinct points, and uh, the sum of the n i is n. So n one p one plus nr pr is basically the set of the points p1 to pr where each point is counted with multiplicity ni. So this is the, the points of the symmetric power. So we might want to know how does the symmetric power look like? So this is supposed to be the quotient of x to the n by the symmetric group. So uh, if a finite group x uh, G acts on an affine variety, say x equal to spec r. So just uh, uh, if r is uh, dx1 to xn divided by some ideal, so it's just uh, the zero set of this uh, uh, ideal in an, uh, then one can obtain the quotient x modulo g as the spectrum of the invariance of uh, the g action on r. So Rg is just the elements in our ring R, which are invariant under the G action. For instance, if we, let's look at the n-fold symmetric power of A1. So A1 is the spectrum of Kt, so power C polynomial ring in one variable. So um, now we are supposed to take the n-fold product. So this is the spectrum of Kt1 to Tn, and then we take the invariance under the action of the symmetric group. So what does these invariants? So it's a standard uh, fact that the invariant polynomials under the uh, action of the symmetric group are just the uh, polynomials in the elementary symmetric functions in the TI. So we have E1 equal to T1 plus Tn and so on. Uh, T2 with the sum of the products of two different elements <coughs> uh, of the TI. And so, we see this is again the spectrum of a polynomial ring, so it's again an. 
So for some, so surprisingly, the quotient of a n by the symmetric group, which is just sum n a one, is again a n. Okay, and in similar way, <clears throat> uh, if we do it for p one, the symmetric power will be p n. And uh, also, if we take the symmetric power, the n symmetric power of a non-singular curve of dimension n, it will be uh, uh, of a non-singular curve, it will be uh, non-singular of dimension n. Now let's look at the case of a surface. If we look at the second symmetric power of a surface, it will already be singular. For instance, let's look at the second symmetric power of A2. So A2 is, uh, uh, so uh, first we take A2 times A2, this is spec of x1, x2, y1, y2 of k x1 x2 y1 y2 and then we take the s2 invariance where s2 change exchanges uh, the variables with uh, index one with those with index two so what are the invariants we can obviously see some of them so for instance x1 plus x2 is invariant now if we exchange x1 and x2 y1 plus y2 is invariant x1 minus x2 will not be invariant, it's sent to its minus, but if we take the square, it's invariant. Same for y1 minus y2, and then also x1 minus x2 times y1 minus y2 is invariant. So we have these five invariant polynomials, and the claim is that these generate all of them. So you have uh, uh, this invariant ring is generated by is spec kxyuv, where u is x1 minus x2 squared and so on. Um, x is equal to x1 minus x2, but these satisfy a relation, namely we can see that u times v minus w squared is equal to zero. No, x1 minus x2 squared times y1 minus uh, y2 squared is equal to x1 minus x2 times y1 minus y2 squared. And so um, this is spec of x, y, u, uh, k, x, y, u, v, modulo this relation. So it's, that means it's the zero set in A5 of a quadratic equation, and you can see it is singular. It is a quadratic cone. So uh, this thing looks like A2, you know, because you have here the variables x, y, times a quadratic cone. So I kind of have a very bad uh, picture of that. So you have parameterized by A2 over each point, you have a quadratic cone, and that's how this thing looks like. So similarly, one can, work in local analytic coordinates near the near any point in the locus where just two points come together and we see that locally in analytic topology near such a point it looks like c to the 2n minus 2 times a quadratic cone so this thing will always be singular and at least uh, the kind of mildest singularities of the symmetric power are these quadratic cones okay so this is the situation <clears throat> Now, what's the Hilbert scheme of endpoints? So the Hilbert scheme of endpoints now parameterizes zero-dimensional subschemes of length n on x, on, on, on our variety x. So we can write, we can view such a thing as being the following data. We have this, such a thing we call z, and it consists of its support, which is a set of points in, uh, in x, plus the structure sheaf, where the structure sheaf <coughs> Is a quotient of the uh, of the structure sheaf of X by the ideal sheaf of Z, and it, this uh, this structure sheaf of Z has finite support. So everywhere except for finitely many points, namely the support of Z, I Z at the point is equal to O X, and O Z is equal to zero there. So um, so that means the subscheme has finite support, and but it is a uh, <clears throat> a it's a, a quotient of OX supported at these points, but you know the at the point uh, it, the quotient at each point. So the and the total. Um, so if it's a zero, if we are in HIP and X, the total dimension as a k-vector space of OZ is n. This is what HIP and X means. So that means if we if it is so, this OZ is nothing else than the direct sum over all the points of the support of the local ring at the point. And so the dimension as the k vector space of Az is the sum over all points 
in the support of the dimension of OZP, and this is equal to N. So <clears throat> I call this dimension of OZP, so the dimension of the local ring at P, the multiplicity of P uh, in the support of Z. <clears throat> And so uh, we again have finite, uh, a finite set of points which have some multiplicities, but we see that when the multiplicity is not just one, we have a non-trivial scheme structure. We don't just know the multiplicity. Um, <clears throat> and there is a forgetful morphism, which is a hubert chow morphism, which forgets about the structure sheaf and just remembers the multiplicities. So it goes from the Hilbert scheme of n points of x to the semantic power. It sends a subscheme to uh, the sum over all the points in its support of the dimension of the local ring at P. So it sends a subscheme to its support with multiplicities. Okay, so this is uh, this thing. And now let's look uh, first at some examples. So we, in the case of curve, so if C is, is a non-singular curve, we know that for every point P and C, the local ring of C at P is a discrete valuation ring. So that means, <clears throat> If I take any, uh, I, the local ring of a um, zero dimensional subscheme at a point will be a power of the maximal ideal. And this power is mp to the n, and this n is just the dimension of the local ring of the subscheme at p. So the subscheme contains no other information than just its multiplicities at the points. So that means, I mean, at least it makes us so. Uh, that will imply that if we look at the Hilbert Chow morphism, which sends uh, the, sub, the, uh, sub, uh, the um, zero dimensional subscreens of length n on C to the symmetric power, this is actually an isomorphism because no information is lost sending a subscreen to its support with multiplicities. In particular, the Hilbert scheme of n points on A1 is An, the Hilbert scheme of n points on P1 is Pn. Now, in the surface case, it's different. <clears throat> Um, namely, there is a theorem by Fogarty, which I will explain a little bit more about later, which says if S is a smooth projective surface, then the Hilbert scheme of n points on S is non-singular of dimension 2n. We already know that the symmetric power uh, of the surface will be singular, so uh, it can obviously not be isomorphic. And in, and in fact, this hilbert chow morphism omega n is a resolution of singularities. That means it's an isomorphism on the smooth locus of the symmetric power, and it's not an isomorphism on the singular locus. And if um, <clears throat> S is an irreducible surface, then the symmetric power is irreducible, and the Hilbert scheme of n points is also irreducible. Okay, so I want to just to, <clears throat> so that it becomes a bit more concrete, look at extremely small examples how it looks like. <clears throat> so, first, what's the Hilbert scheme of zero points on a variety X? So that's very simple. Zero points means we have the empty set. So that doesn't mean that the Hilbert scheme of zero points is the empty side set. The Hilbert scheme of zero points is one point which parameterizes the empty set. So the Hilbert scheme of zero points on X is a point, and that point parameterizes the empty set. So if we look at the Hilbert scheme of one point on X, it parameterizes the points on X. And everybody knows a variety which uh, parameterizes the points on X, that's X itself. And one can see that the Hilbert scheme of one point on X is indeed X. Then now looks at the Hilbert scheme of two points. So if we look at the Hilbert scheme of two points, and we have a subscheme of length two on X, so this is a general point of this will be just a set of two distinct points on X. So Z would be PQ. P is different from Q. The other possibility is that the support is just one point, and uh, Z is the zero set of an, an ideal such that the quotient uh, by that ideal has vector space dimension two. So that means that this ideal must lie between the maximal ideal at P and the maximum ideal at P squared. And as the total dimension of the quotient by IZP is equal to two, it must be that the dimension of MP modulo IZP is equal to one. So IZP is given by a one-dimensional subvector space, uh, uh, yeah, a one-dimensional subvector space. No, 
uh, it's given by a one-dimensional quotient of uh, mp modulo mp squared. So that means giving our subscheme z is equivalent to giving a point p and something which I call tp, where tp is an element in the space of one-dimensional quotients, the projective space of one-dimensional quotients of mp modulo mp squared, which is the space, same as the space of ten tangent directions at p. So a subscheme of length two on the surface is the same as either two points on x or a point on x and a tangent direction at that point. So this gives us, when one does it carefully, that the Hilbert scheme of two points on x can be globally described as follows. We take x times x, we blow it up along the diagonal. So that means every point is uh, uh, replaced by the projectivization of the tangent space at that point of x on the diagonal. And then the action of the symmetric group in two le letters lifts to this, and we take the quotient of this blow up by this. And this is uh, the global description. So I haven't given you the proof, but that's how it is. So this was a kind of informal uh, description, and we can see a little bit how it looks like. Now, let's be a bit more formal and define the Hilbert scheme properly, and uh, kind of try to at least give some idea how some, I, some kind of properties follow from this uh, definition. So, um, so we have until now somehow described the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S by saying what its points are, you know, the points over K. You know, the points are the zero and dimensional subscheme of length N. I mean, or, how, but that doesn't, de doesn't determine it. You know, it's not like you can determine a scheme by saying what its points are. You have to say, what is the scheme? And this, you can do if you, in terms of the points, if you say more general what you mean by points. Uh, every scheme is defined defined by its functor of points, which is the map which sends every uh, every scheme t to the morphisms from t to the scheme. And uh, <clears throat> so let's look at this more carefully. So if x is a scheme, we have a contravariant functor, sometimes called the Oneda functor, hx, from, or the functor of points, uh, from schemes to sets, which sends uh, a scheme t to xt, which is the morphisms, so the uh, algebraic maps, from t to x. And this is a functor by pullback. So if we have a morphism from T1 to T2, we can compose uh, our morphism from T2 to X with phi and get a morphism from T1 to X. So this will give me a functor or the reasonable uh, diagrams will commute. So we get a functor, this is the functor of points. And by definition, the points of X, which are defined over K, are just the morphisms from spec K to x. So the, we get as a kind of small part of the functor of points, we get the actual points of x. But the, the maps from t to x are sometimes called the t-valued points. So it's a kind of more general points, and these actually determine the scheme. So how does this work? <clears throat> so this is a, goes under the name Yoneda's lemma. So every scheme is determined by its functor of points up to unique isomorphs. So <clears throat> I will not maybe properly explain, but what it means for us is that if we have an isomorphism of functors between the functor of points of X, from the functor of point of X to the functor of points of Y, this induces an isomorphism of schemes from X to Y. And how does it go? We can define our morphism from X to Y as the functor phi applied to the identity on X. Because by our definition, if we apply phi to the identity on X, this gives us a morphism from X to Y. And the inverse of that will be phi to the minus one applied to the identity on Y. So this is uh, very simple by just somehow <clears throat> uh, abstract nonsense. 
you get uh, <clears throat> you get this and you can uh, prove that a scheme is actually determined by its factor of points and so uh, if one wants to look at modelized bases what one will know is what the factor of points is and so this is a way to describe the scheme and work with it so let's look at this now for uh, <clears throat> You know, in general for modelized spaces first and then for the Hilbert scheme. So a modelized space uh, by definition will be a space which parameterizes certain objects we are interested in. So this could be sub-schemes, vector bundles, sheaves, curves, whatever. Uh, we want it to parameterize them in such a way that it's determined by them. As I said, to determine a uh, a space or a scheme, it's not sufficient to say what its point over field K are. You have to say what its functor of point is. So that means the modelized space should not just parameterize the objects we are interested in, but families of them. So if you have a family of the objects we're interested in parameterized by a scheme T, this should correspond to a morphism from T to our modelized space. And uh, this uh, technically means that this modelized space should represent the model of factor. And so let's uh, see what it means to represent a factor. So if phi from schemes to sets, to sets is a contravariant factor, a scheme is said to represent this factor if there is an isomorphism, isomorphism of factors from the factor of points of x to phi. That means for every scheme T, there is a bijection from the morphism of, from T to X to phi of T. So we think of phi of T, the family of uh, objects parameterized by this thing, and then this corresponds to morphism from T to our model space. And these have to be compatible with pullback uh, correctly defined to make it a factor, not just a, a bijection. So now let's do it for the Hilbert scheme. So let X now be a projective scheme, H, which I also write O of one, an ample line bundle on X. So that means the sections of H will, uh, or at least of power of X will uh, define an embedding of X into some projective space. So the, <clears throat> the Hilbert functor is the contrabearing functor from schemes to sets, which sends a scheme T to the set of all subschemes ZT in the product of X and T, which are closed subschemes and they are flat over T. I can view these as families of subschemes in X parameterized by T. So that means if I take the fiber of this ZT over point small t in T, this fiber is a subscheme in X. And so we get a kind of family. And the condition to be a family to kind of move nicely when one uh, moves in T is the flatness condition. Now, to be flat is a somewhat mysterious condition. I think even uh, some famous person says, uh, you know, he doesn't, and maybe even Gordon Lee says he, he, he didn't understand flatness, but it's the thing that works. And so uh, that we use here. <clears throat> um, uh, so I'll say in a moment more about it. And obviously it's supposed to be a functor. So if we have a morphism of schemes, then we uh, it corresponds to pulling back the subscheme via the identity on X times this map phi. So taking the inverse image. So this gives us uh, a functor. So this is the Hilbert. Yeah, there, is, there is a question on the chat. Uh, should yeah. I read it to you? Yeah, OK. Uh, what it needs to be projective scheme? Uh, I mean, for this uh, to talk about it, one doesn't need projective, but I will later want to prove that it's representable. And uh, for that, one needs some kind of property that X is not too big. And at least the standard result is that X is projective. So it's enough also that X is quasi projective if one defines things correctly. But anyway, uh, it's just that. We want this Hilbert functor to be represented again by a projective scheme. And for this, we need X to be projective. We will see this also in the kind of sketch that I give in the, in the uh, 
I mean, in the proof, I mean, the kind of very rough idea of how one proves that the Hilbert functor is representable. So, uh, you know, otherwise, if X is any kind of scheme, which is uh, very big, then this thing might not be representable. If X is quasi projective, one has to put something more. It must be closed and say proper uh, over T or something like that. And then it, but then it's constructed, you know, if X is quasi projective, it's a closed subset of a projective scheme. It's an open subset of a projective scheme. And uh, then the Hilbert scheme of uh, that. Uh, Quasi projective scheme will just be an, an open subset of the Hilbert scheme of the projective scheme. So everything is reduced to the projective case. Okay, so I, I didn't explain to you what flatness is, but the main property of flatness is that it preserves the so called Hilbert polynomial. So if I have a scheme Z, then the Hilbert polynomial is done as follows. We take the dimension of the space of sections of uh, uh, OZ uh, of on Z of O of M, so of OZ of M. So we just twist the structure C of Z by high high power of M. If M is sufficiently large, then this number will be a polynomial in M. So for small values in M, it's not necessarily a polynomial, but if you uh, make M large, it's a polynomial in M. This polynomial is called the Hilbert polynomial. And uh, one can show that. Um, it's easy to see that the dimension, the degree of the Hilbert polynomial as a polynomial is the dimension of Z as a, as a scheme. And for instance, if we have just a set of n points, then this Hilbert polynomial is just a constant n. Because uh, no, it's constant because uh, the dimension is zero. And uh, the Hilbert polynomial, then h0 of z o to the m is just h0 of z o, which is just the sum of the structure sheets of m points, so that's n. So in that case, for n points, the Hilbert polynomial is the constant n. So, and now the theorem is that if uh, z t in x times t is a closed subscheme, which is flat over t, and t is connected, then, uh, and z t is the fiber over a point in t, or point small t and t, then the Hilbert polynomial of z t is independent of the point t and t. And in fact, it's almost under. If you make some strong assumption, maybe that t is uh, reduced, and we are uh, I don't know precisely what else. Then this is actually equivalent. So the, it's a rather uh, it it really characterizes flatness. So the Hilbert polynomial is very important here. And so um, <clears throat> now the, what we will see is that the Hilbert scheme, Hilbert X, is represent. So we have a Hilbert scheme which represents the Hilbert functor. So that means for all schemes, there is a natural bijection from the morphisms from the uh, from T to the Hilbert scheme with the uh, Hilbert functor of T, which is compatible with the pullback. <clears throat> and um, uh, this is done as follows. So for every numerical polynomial P, so it's just the polynomials in one variable such if that we put, if you put an integer in, we get an integer out. So, but it could be rational, the polynomial could have rational coefficients, but it has this property. Uh, and then we let Hilp PX to be the subfunctor of the Hilbert functor, which parameterizes families of subschemes with where the Hilbert polynomial of the fiber is this polynomial P. And then one has the following theorem, which is uh, uh, which we go to due to Gothenburg. So for every polynomial p, uh, the this Hilbert function, this Hilbert uh, functor with the polynomial p is represented by a projective scheme Hilbert px, so a scheme which lies in some which is closed in some projective space, and the Hilbert scheme itself, which parameterizes families of all families of subschemes in X of arbitrary dimension and arbitrary Hilbert polynomial is uh, represented by the disjoint union over all numerical polynomials P of the Hilbert uh, of uh, the space parameterizing the Hilbert uh, <clears throat> the Hilbert functor polynomial P. So that means this Hilbert functor is by itself not projective. It's an infinite union of projective schemes. So it's arbitrary large, 
but it has many components. Each component is a projective scheme and is somehow finite. And now the Hilbert scheme of points, Hilbert X, is just one part of this uh, Hilbert scheme, uh, namely the Hilbert scheme with the polynomial P, where P is the constant polynomial N. No? So P does is actually not, uh, I mean, it's a polynomial does not depend on M when we twist by, uh, by O of M, it's just constant. And uh, we had seen that uh, general, so for instance, if uh, we have just a set of N points, the Hilbert polynomial is the constant N. And so this is uh, here, the more general thing. Okay, so this is this. I want to give some very rough idea how this could be true. Um, because, <clears throat> you know, it's by itself a very surprising and mysterious fact, you know, to say that something is represented by a projective scheme means you somehow find a space which lies, uh, uh, find a scheme which lies in some projective space such that it represents this functor. So that all that, for instance, each point in this thing corresponds to a point in the scheme in projective space. So it, you know, somehow one would like to know how this can possibly come to pass. I mean, how do you find this space? And uh, so I give a, just the rough idea. The actual proof is very difficult. Maybe it takes 30 pages or, or something. You can find it's, uh, you can write books about it. <clears throat> but uh, the idea is relatively simple. So if Z is a subscheme with Hilbert polynomial P, so we know, and we, so now we take uh, our M very large, then we know that H0 of Z O of M is equal to P of M. This is how the Hilbert polynomial was defined. And if we take M each even larger, one can show that for all subschemes, so we can find one M so that for all subschemes with Hilbert polynomial P, the restriction map from the global sections of on X of O of M to the global sections of Z of O of M is surjective. And now this already allows us to get somehow into some kind of finite situation, because now we can do the following. We can say, okay, we have a map from uh, the subschemes with Hilbert polynomial P to the Gress, to a Gress mania. Namely, we send a subscheme Z to this H0 of Z O Z of M viewed as a quotient of uh, H0 of X O of M. So this is a Grassmannian uh, of uh, quotients of dimension P of M of this vector space. So this is just a normal Grassmann graph. And so we have a map from here to here. And now, if M is large enough, one can show that this map is injective. So it sends different points and the image is closed, is a closed subset. So I should say that both one and two are very difficult to prove. I just say what happens. So this often goes under the name of uh, uh, Castelnovo, Castelnovo Mumford regularity and uh, this also has some name attributed to it, which I forget. <clears throat> anyway, so these are difficult to prove, but this is uh, the idea how one does it. And now, in some sense, it's clear what one wants to do. You know, so we have this thing inside this Grassmannian, we find a closed sub variety uh, whose points are uh, these sub schemes, uh, correspond to these sub schemes. And then one shows, which is also work, that the image of this map represents the Hilbert function. And that makes it projective. Uh, so as I said, each of these steps is, uh, steps is difficult, but it gives the following. So we find this Hilbert scheme uh, with respect to the Hilbert polynomial P inside this Grassmannian. And then there is the Plücker embedding, which sends, uh, which embeds the Grassmannian of M-dimensional quotients, uh, of P of M-dimensional quotients of this vector space to the Pro projectivization of the P of M exterior power of this vector space. So this is the standard Glücker embedding classical. And so via this decomposition of these embeddings, if P of X will be a closed subscheme of a given projective space. And so this makes, uh, uh, this uh, allows us to represent this function. Okay, so as I said, the details of these are very complicated, but the idea is somehow, you know, 
at least one knows where it comes from. And you also see that this Hilbert function plays a big role in it and so on. So I also want to use this factorial description to tell you something about uh, the tangent space of uh, the Hilbert scheme. So I don't know whether you are aware of that, I hope, but it's a kind of standard fact, and you can also think about it, that if you have a scheme, its tangent space at a point is determined also by the functor of points. Namely, if y is a scheme, p in y is a point defined over k, then the tangent space of y at p can be identified as a set of morphisms from spec k epsilon modulo epsilon squared, so kind of fat point in one direction to y, which sends the closed point uh, spec k to p. So you can somehow think of this spec k modulo epsilon, okay, spec k epsilon modulo epsilon squared as a fat point which goes in one direction, a very a first order uh, 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 part of a smooth curve. And if you map it to this, what we what you will find is the point you map it to plus the tangent direction that the tangent direction of the curve goes to. So this is uh, anyway this is a, a standard fact which one um, uh, finds everywhere also in Hartshorn and so on. And um, it's very good to know because somehow it's the way you know, if one looks at moduli spaces you know what its functor of point is so then we know what the tangent space at the point is. Now we want to use this for uh, the Hilbert scheme of points. And the statement is that the tangent space to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on X at a subscheme corresponding to Z, to a scheme Z, so at a point corresponding to a subscheme Z, is the homomorphisms of OX modules from the ideal sheaf at Z to the structure sheaf at Z. I want to give some rough idea why this might be true. Obviously, this is not a proof. The details are always more complicated. But <clears throat> so according to what I just said, the tangent space to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints of X at the subscheme or at the point corresponding to the subscheme Z is the, you know, is via the, you know, is the same as the Hilbert functor on uh, K epsilon mod epsilon. So this is the set of subschemes can be identified with the set of subschemes Z tilde in X times spec K epsilon modulo epsilon squared flat over spec K epsilon mod K epsilon squared. These are the morphisms from uh, uh, spec K epsilon mod epsilon squared to the Hilbert scheme according to the fact that it represents this functor. And then whose restriction to the closed point of K epsilon mod epsilon squared, which is just the fiber of that is just X, is Z. So we have kind of a subscheme in a kind of thickening of x in an extra direction, uh, of uh, which if I restrict it just to x itself, it is z. So this is um, this is the tangent space at z. And now we can ask ourselves what has this to do with the homomorphism from O from I Z to O Z. And we can at least uh, there's it's relatively easy to see what can happen. So if we have such a subscheme, we can write its ideal in uh, as f plus ep epsilon f tilde, where f lies in the ideal of z, for some suitable elements uh, f tilde in Ox. Now, because obviously the, the, the structure sheaf here is just uh, the structure sheaf of x plus epsilon times uh, the structure sheaf of x, and epsilon squared is equal to zero. So it looks like that. <clears throat> and um, one can show that i z tilde depends only on the class uh, of f tilde in O z. So, if we divide by the ideal of z, this is because you know it's it's an ideal, and uh, so if we uh, multiply, if this thing would lie in i z, then it's already determined by the uh, original z. So, um, <clears throat> and one we also see that if the map which sends f to the class in O of z of, uh, of f tilde is an Ox model homomorphism. This is because i z tilde is an ideal. Now, if we multiply by an element in, uh, in Ox, 
then uh, it should be uh, it should also be in the ideal and this uh, uh, implies this so this means to such a tangent vector we have associated indeed a homomorphism from iz to oz you know, sending uh, this is the homomorphism which sends, sends every element f in iz to the class of f tilde and conversely if we have such a homomorphism we uh, just take we just put the ideal sheaf of z in uh, equal to f plus epsilon f tilde for all uh, f so the union of all of this for f in iz and f tilde is any lift of phi of f to x Okay, so there are many details to check here. I mean, I said it also a bit fast, but anyway, I just wanted to say that at least one can see there's a connection between the two. So the tangent space and this. So now <clears throat> with this, we have that, uh, I can again state this theorem that if S is a smooth projective irreducible surface, then the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S is irreducible and smooth of dimension to N. And, uh, I will again just indicate what the steps of the proof are. So first one sh has to show that the Hilbert scheme of endpoints in S is connected. That's not trivial. You know, you have to somehow see that every zero dimensional scheme um, on S can be deformed to any other one. And uh, you know, there are some steps you can, uh, but uh, I will not go into detail. Then <clears throat> one wants to show that the dimension of the tangent space of the Hilbert scheme endpoints on S at, the, uh, at any point is at most 2n, which is supposed to be the dimension uh, of the Hilbert scheme for all points in the Hilbert scheme. And then that's actually enough with this one has shown it, namely the locus inside the Hilbert scheme of n points is an open subset which has an open subset which has dimension 2n because we have n points varying in varying in S, so this has dimension 2n, it's an open subset. And so if we take the closure of this uh, open subset, then this will be uh, a variety of dimension n. And if the dimension of the tangent space is at most 2n, at every point it must be smooth. And there can be no other component of the Hilbert scheme of n points, because it's a standard fact that if we have two components of a scheme intersecting, then the dimension of the tangent space at the intersection point is bigger than the biggest dimension of the tangent space of any component. And so, uh, I mean, or at least, um, I mean, the, the dimension of the tangent space, I mean, if one of them is smooth, then the, so if we, then the dimension of the tangent space is bigger than uh, the dimension of the smooth thing. So it means if, if, this thing would have two irreducible components which intersect, then the dimension of attention space at the intersection space, at the intersection point would have to be bigger than 2n. You know? It's um, just a fact if you have two uh, varieties of dimension uh, n1 and n2, and they intersect in a point, the dimension at the tangent space of the union at the intersection point is bigger than the dimension of both varieties, strictly big. Okay, so <clears throat> finally, I want to talk about tautological bundles and the universal family. Uh, I've said that, that the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S represents this Hilbert function. So that means we have an isomorphism of functors between the functor of points of the Hilbert scheme and the Hilbert function. So, so this implies, so that means the morphisms from a scheme to the Hilbert scheme are uh, in bijection with the families of subschemes uh, parametrized by this scheme. So this implies that there is a universal family. Namely, if I apply this functor to the identity on the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S, this will be the so-called universal family. Because, <clears throat> so if you, if you apply this to the identity of the Hilbert scheme of points, this is a closed subscheme, Z and S, in S times the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S, uh, flat over the Hilbert scheme of endpoints. That's uh, what uh, the meaning of representing the functor is. And you can see 
that if you project down to the Hilbert scheme of n points on S, the fiber, this is flat of degree n, and the fiber z uh, over the point corresponding to the subscheme z is just the scheme z. So it is in that sense a universal a topological family, which uh, over every point of the Hilbert scheme, the fiber is the subscheme parametrized by that point. And this all in a flat frame. And set theoretically, you can uh, convince yourself that it can be described as follows. It's just the incidence correspondence of points in S and, and uh, the points corresponding to subschemes in the Hilbert scheme, such that the point lies in the subscheme. So it's a very simple set theoretical description, but I'm not claiming that it is non reduced. This I have not thought about. Okay. So now we can use this to define some vector bundles on the Hilbert scheme. So if you have a vector bundle, say rank R on S, we can do the following. We take this vector bundle, we pull it back uh, to the universe family from S, and we push it forward to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints. Now the map from the Hilbert scheme from the universal family to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints is flat of uh, degree n. So this means if we start out with the vector bundle of degree uh, of rank R on S, then pulling back makes it still a vector bundle of rank R on the universal family, but pushing it forward makes it a vector bundle of rank R times n. So to every vector bundle uh, V on the surface, we get a vector bundle on the uh, Hilbert scheme whose rank is uh, n times the original rank. And in fact, we can see what the fiber is over a point. So if, if Z is the point in the Hilbert scheme, the fiber over the point corresponding, you know, the, uh, the point corresponding to a subscheme Z is just V tensor over K, K the structure sheath of the subscheme, which after all is an n dimensional vector space. So the fiber is, uh, looks like this. And so these tautological bundles, so this gives us bundles on the Hilbert scheme. These tautological bundles are very important for uh, studying Hilbert scheme of points. Basically, uh, essentially all reasonable questions about Hilbert schemes of points can be posed in terms of tautological bundles. So uh, basically one needs to understand those. Okay, so now this was kind of the part where I was a little bit more precise, was maybe still fast, but uh, now I will be a little bit more sketchy. On the other hand, uh, you know, it's so just to give you an idea uh, what there is. So the first thing I was wanting to talk about the betting numbers of the Hilbert scheme, which uh, 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 was also mentioned in the introduction that uh, uh, <clears throat> that was given. So um, so let me briefly talk about that. Uh, mostly to, to see what's going on. I mean that these spaces can be studied and have some nice properties. So let's uh, try to, I don't know how to get rid of this. Um, anyway, can you, is this in front of the, can one remove this somehow? Uh, what do you want to remove? I don't I mean, there's something in my thing, there's something in front of part of the screen which uh, obscures something. But anyway, maybe it's okay. Maybe if you don't see uh, it, it's fine. Yeah, I don't see it. Okay, then it's fine. I mean, I, I, I think I know what I wrote. So, so if, um, so let's, we want to first give a stratification of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S. So assume we have a partition of N. So that means, so new, I call the partition new. So it's some numbers N1 until NR. So that n1 is bigger or equal to n2 and so on, bigger or equal to nr. And the sum of these numbers is equal to n. And then we associate to this a locally closed subset or lo locally closed subscheme. So uh, uh, <clears throat> in the Hilbert scheme of uh, in the semantic power of S, this is just the set of all points in the semantic power, which can be written as uh, some ni times pi, where the ni are these numbers in the partition, and the pi are distinct points in S. So that means we're looking at the uh, 
uh, kind of <clears throat> points. Uh, so, so to treat endpoints counted with multiplicities, we are more precisely, we actually have R points and the multiplicities of the points are these NIs. So this is a locally closed subset in the semantic power. So incidentally, as I will, am going to use this in a moment, we can actually say a little bit more about it. So this, <clears throat> you know, so this is actually, one can see that this will be smooth, but um, if we, as long as the points are distinct, but if we want to look at the closure of the set, it's actually uh, not so nice when some of these points come together, but we can look at the no normalization. So if the, uh, if the partition, if you write this partition n1 to nr as one to the mu1 and so on unto n to the mu n, so that means the mu i say how often the number i occurs around, among the ni, then one can show that the normalization of the closure of this stratum is just the product of the semantic of the mu j's semantic powers of s. I mean, you can actually, uh, I mean, you can see that the if you take the product of the mu j semantic power, uh, you can you have a map from this to uh, the closure of this stratum, which sends um, so uh, this two this uh, this tuple of uh, uh, of sets of uh, of mu j points uh, to uh, the semantic power by just adding them up, uh, but just taking the formal sum of them, where the multiplicity of this, uh, if we are in the jth component, uh, in the jth part here, the multiplicity is j. And this gives us uh, something in the closure of this. If these points here are all different, not just in this thing, but also in the different parts are all different, then the image will be precisely uh, the, this sum n mu of s. So this is a way to describe the normalization. Okay, so this is uh, an aside, but I'm going to use it in a moment. So now we can use this uh, stratification of the semantic power. So these are locally closed subsets of uh, the semantic power and the union of them over all partitions will be equal to the whole semantic power. So <clears throat> We can just take the inverse image of these strata, sum n mu s, via the Hilbert charm morphism. So these will be locally closed subsets of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S. And uh, so, according to what I said, the, this uh, stratum, Hilbert nu on S, parameterizes subschemes of S, which are concentrated in R points and the multiplicities at these points are in one to n r. So we have sub non reduced subschemes uh, uh, of these multiplicities at these points. And that the stratification means that these things uh, are locally closed in the section of open and closed subsets. And their un if I take their union and they are disjoint, and if I take their union, uh, this is the whole of the Hilbert scheme of n. So we have a stratification into locally closed subschemes, uh, locally closed subsets like this. Or locally closed subschemes in this risk topology. So this is the situation. And how do we? Uh, so for instance, if we look at our uh, the thing we described before, if we take the Hilbert scheme of two points on S, we have two strata. We have the um, the partition one one. Hilbert one one of S is just uh, uh, S times S on, without the diagonal uh, divided by the symmetric group in two letters. And Hilbert two two of S. So is just the subscheme is concentrated in a point, and we had seen that this is just a projectivization of the tangent bundle of S. So this is a P1 bundle over S. <clears throat> now I want to briefly talk about the cohomology of these things. So <clears throat> if we have, so assume we have a manifold X or a nice topological space, then it has a cohomology. So assume X has real dimension D, then we have the total cohomology, which is a direct sum of the ith cohomology group from i, h i from, or i from zero to d. So we have these. So, I mean, if you know what cohomology is, then it's fine. If you don't, I can just say that very naively, uh, we can view elements in this cohomology, in the ith cohomology, 
as formal sums, sum i, n i, the class of a i, where the n i are some integers, or if we, the coefficient instead of z is q, then they are rational numbers, and the a i are equivalence classes of i co-dimensional sub-manifolds of x. This is not always true, but you know, for us this will be fine. Uh, and I do not tell you what the equivalence relation is, you know, they are, <clears throat> but anyway, so this is what we get. So this is the cohomology, <clears throat> and as I don't tell you what the equivalence is, uh, this doesn't really tell you how to work with it, but anyway, this is uh, the space. So um, this is also, so by itself, this is a, it are, is a graded, uh, is a group, but under addition, because we can add the coefficients, uh, but it's also a ring. Namely, uh, there's a so-called cup product, which I just write as times, which uh, is induced by the following. Assume we have the classes of submanifolds A and B, which are transversal to each other. So they intersect transversally, so the dimension of the intersection, oops, um, of the intersection, the co-dimension of the intersection is uh, the sum of the co-dimensions, and uh, the intersection is also smooth and so on. So, so if they are transversal, then the product will be just the class of the intersection. And now the, this uh, equivalence relation allows us to deform uh, these submanifolds so that they become transversal, so we can do this. And then obviously uh, the elements in the cohomology are such formal sums, so we just then use the distributive law to say what the product of any two elements in cohomology is. In addition, there's one further ingredient with is the Poincaré duality isomorphism. So there is an, uh, an isomorphism of uh, Z modules of uh, from HD of X. So there's isomorphism of the top cohomology, so the Dth cohomology if X has dimension D to Z, so which uh, so the Dth cohomology in a natural so natural sense uh, is just Z, and we denote this. Um, as the integral uh, of, if alpha is a homology class, the integral over x of alpha. This is because one can also, uh, if one wants, represent uh, homology in terms of differential forms, and then indeed uh, this evaluation would correspond to the integral. But uh, this doesn't play a role for us, but uh, you know, this is uh, often, uh, in algebraic geometry, one often uses this notation. Um, and so there are some invariants associated to that. For one thing, we have the Betty numbers. These are just the rank, the ith Betty number is the rank of the ith, here I wrote homology, but one can also put the i up of the ith homology of x, the h i. Um, we uh, can combine all the Betty numbers to get the so-called Poincaré polynomial. So we just take a polynomial whose coefficients uh, are the Betty numbers. So sum i from zero to the dimension of x, B i of x, z of i, this is the Poincaré polynomial. And a very important and simple invariant of uh, a manifold is its Euler characteristic or Euler number. This is just the alternating sum of the B i, so sum minus one to the i B i of x, which according to the definition of the Poincaré polynomial is just the Poincaré polynomial evaluated at uh, z equal to minus one. So, uh, Okay, so for instance, the Euler characteristic of uh, S, uh, <clears throat> S2 of the two sphere is two, which is uh, after all Euler's uh, famous result uh, uh, observation about regular uh, po polyedas. Um, okay, so now I want to somehow say, but not properly, how one computes these Betty numbers of the Hilbert scheme of points. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot give a, a proper proof, but there, there are a number of methods to prove it. So one can either, uh, for instance, use that you have a modelized space and uh, look at the whole problem over a finite field. And as it's a modelized space, we know what the functor of points is. We know we can compute or determine how many subschemes of length n are there over finite fields. And then the veil conjectures allow us to compute the Betty numbers. 
or there are many others. You can use uh, you can cut the Hilbert scheme into nice pieces and uh, compute the, the Betty numbers, uh, and then uh, use that to compute it. <clears throat> but here I use uh, uh, some. I, the shortest proof is in terms of perverse sheaves, which uh, I'm certainly not going to explain to you what they are. Um, so, but they allow you to do something very simple. So, uh, this Hilbert Shaw morphism from the Hilbert scheme of endpoints of S to the somatic power is what is called semi small with respect to the stratification that I just gave in terms of partitions for the Hilbert scheme and the somatic power. So, what that means, if I look at the fibers of this morphism over a stratum, the dimension of the fibers is half the co-dimension of the stratum. So this is what is semi-small. So if, uh, if the stratum has co-dimension two, then the fiber over the stratum has dimension one. This is, for instance, true if we look at the Hilbert scheme uh, of two points, then we have the, the when we take the stratification when we take the stratum where these two points come together, so Hill two two of S, this uh, this corresponding symmetric power is just sum to two of S, which is S, and the fiber over every point of this is a P one, so the co-dimension is two, and the dimension of the fiber is one, and this in general is true always. So the fiber over sum and n of S is just naturally the Hilbert scheme of endpoints is isomorphic to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints in E2 with support in zero. And over the stratum sum n, n1 to nr is just the product of the corresponding thing, uh, the corresponding Hilbert scheme of subschemes concentrated in the point of length ni over all the i equal one to r. This is just because, you know, if you have r distinct points, as a support, and you have a subscheme supported in these R distinct points, uh, which is uh, which has a non-trivial scheme structure. Uh, saying what the scheme structure over the whole thing is is the same as saying over every point what the uh, what the scheme structure of the subscheme support in that point is. Anyway, so this is the statement, and then by general focus focus of uh, these perverse sheets, one gets uh, this formula. So. The Poincare polynomial of the Hilbert scheme of n points on S is the sum over all partitions of n. So this is how one writes partitions. We take the product over, we again write these partitions as one to the mu one and n to the mu n. So we remember how often the number i occurs in the partition, p of sim mu i of s z times z to this power. And how does this come to pass? I told you that the normalization of the, of the closure of the stratum was the product of these uh, symmetric powers here. And the general formalism of the uh, perverse sheaf says that in this situation, if you have a semi-small, uh, uh, if you have a if you have a map which is semi-small for stratification on both sides. And um, uh, maybe the downstairs, you have only finite quotient singularities. Uh, then the uh, Poincare polynomial upstairs is the sum over the Poincare polynomials of uh, the normalizations of the closures of all the normalizations of the closures of all the stratas downstairs times z squared to the dimension of the fiber over the strata. And this is precisely what I've written down. But obviously, to 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 prove this, uh, I mean, this is uh, a statement about perverse sheaves that I cannot. Uh, uh, but it's uh, kind of the beginning of the story. Anyway, so this gives us the Betty number. So let's uh, try to. Uh, so we have here a formula which tells us what the Poincaré polynomial of the Hilbert scheme is in terms of the Poincaré polynomials of Hilbert schemes or of symmetric powers. So let's. Uh, so for instance, again in our example, if we took at the Hilbert scheme of two points. We see that the Poincare polynomial, that's uh, its Poincare polynomial, is the one of the symmetric power of S, the second plus C squared times the Poincare polynomial of S. Of S. Uh, okay, so 
Now, I want to reinterpret this in terms of generating functions. So if I have some numbers, a n, which are parameterized by integers, say positive integers, a n, then it's, and somehow these numbers are related to each other, then it's a good idea to study their generating function, some n, a n x to the n. So often some relations between these numbers, which are somehow hidden or difficult to understand, become kind of more obvious or more understandable in terms of the as properties of the generating function. So let's look at it in our case. So first we have that um, the cohomology of the semantic power can, can be obtained. You know, we know that uh, the semantic power is the n fold product of s divided by the action of the semantic group of n letters. So the cohomology of the semantic power can be obtained as uh, the cohomology of the n fold product, the invariance under the action of the semantic group by, by pullback via uh, uh, the action. So they are just the invariance. And one can work out what these are. <clears throat> and one of the simplest ways <coughs> to write down. The result is we can write down the generating function of the Poincare polynomials of the semantic powers. And this is a kind of rather nice uh, product formula, which is, I think, originally due to McDonald. So we assume that x is uh, irreducible. So uh, the zeroth Betty number is one, and the top Betty number is also one. And then we have here in the numerator, we have one plus, uh, yeah, this there's a mistake. Take. So here's one plus z x uh, p one of s uh, times one plus z squared x p three of x, and then we have these in the denominator. So we have the simple um, <clears throat> uh, generating function. And now, so this is a, an exercise. If you, uh, you know, work out what this means, um, and now we know that for the Hilbert scheme, we have this uh, formula for the polynomials in terms of semantic powers. So we can somehow carry, you know, see what this formula means for the generating functions. And it's not very difficult uh, to figure out that what we get is we get in some sense, you know, the same formula again, but infinitely many times uh, shifted a little bit, you know, because of this shift with the K comes from this factor here. And so it's uh, the generating function of them with the, the product over all k bigger than zero. And we have now one plus e to the two, two k minus one x to the k this. So we have what we had here, but times uh, x to the uh, k minus one uh, times z to the uh, k minus two k minus two. So here, I remember the x was missing. Uh, I mean, I, I should have written x <laughs> and so on. So we have this kind of infinite product like this, which simply comes from this. And so we have this very nice uh, generating function, which is kind of, uh, uh, which gives us all the Betty numbers of all the Hilbert schemes at once in one infinite product. Incidentally, um, we can also, we get a much simpler formula for the Euler number, because after all, how do you get the Euler number? You get the Euler number by putting z equal to minus one. If we put, put z equal to minus one, here it just means uh, the z goes away because we have even powers. And here we have odd powers and a plus. So we this is replaced by minus one. So we have uh, one minus z to the sum of the odd Betty numbers divided by one minus z to the sum of the even Betty numbers. This means we have one minus uh, one minus x to the k. Uh, so we have one minus x to the k to the minus the Euler number. So just by putting z equal to minus one. So we get this very simple uh, product formula for the Euler number. And uh, <clears throat> this uh, is kind of, so we have this very nice formula and uh, it's maybe not very impressive, but uh, this formula can be related to modular form modular forms. I'm not going to tell you what modular forms are, but these are some very special functions which are related to uh, number theory and the model of elliptic curves and also be, play a lot of a role in physics and string theory and so on. Um, so 
the kind of most standard, or, uh, most basic model of form is the discriminant function delta of q, which is q times product k bigger than zero, one minus q to the k to the 24. And there's the eta function, which is its 24th root. Um, <clears throat> and this formula obviously just says that if we take the sum n bigger than zero, the Euler number of the Hilbert scheme of n points on s q to the n, this is q to the Euler number of s divided by 24 times the eta function to the minus the Euler. So it's expressed in this way in terms of modular form. And in fact, <clears throat> this is a can be viewed as a special case and one of the motivating examples of the buffer witten conjecture and uh, buffer witten invariants, which somehow relate generating functions of Euler numbers of modular spaces of sheaves to modular forms. And uh, uh, this should be somehow related to the talk of, uh, of Martin Kohl tomorrow, although I don't know what he will be talking about, but uh, at least it's kind of a first instance of uh, what one studies when one studies for forbidden invariants. Okay, so this was that. Then I don't know, maybe, well, maybe I will be very fast about this. <clears throat> uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily understand it. So, uh, you know, we had this very nice uh, generating function for the for polynomials for the betting numbers of the Hilbert scheme of points. So somehow this gives you the impression that if I take all the cohomologies of all the Hilbert scheme of points of S together, they should be governed by some nice common structure which is responsible for this formula. And so this is indeed the case. Um, <clears throat> so we can write Fn to be the cohomology of the Hilbert scheme of n points on S, say with two coefficients, and we write f to be the direct sum over all n of the uh, of this fn. So it's just the direct sum over all the cohomologies of all the Hilbert schemes of points of n points on S. And um, then uh, Nakajima showed that f is an irreducible representation of the Heisenberg algebra modeled on the cohomology of S. So what uh, could this possibly mean? So this H, this Heisenberg algebra, is an infinite dimensional V algebra. So it's generated by uh, these elements uh, Pn of alpha, where n is an integer. Alpha is an element in the cohomology of S. And we will call the Pn of alpha with n bigger than zero will be called the creation operators. The one with n smaller than zero will be called the annihilation operators. Uh, in the actually p zero is is zero, so that uh, doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> um, and then uh, this algebra, uh, so it's a Lie algebra, so it has some commutation relations. So it's kind of almost commutative, namely. Uh, so commutation means uh, so the this, the commutator of a and b is just a b minus b a, and so if we take the commutator of p n of alpha and p m of beta. Uh, this is um, defined to be minus one to the n minus one times. So this is almost always zero. So almost always they commute. But if um, uh, unless n is equal to minus m, and then up to the sign and this constant, it's the we take the product in cohomology of the class alpha and beta on it on S, so these are cohomology class on S, we integrate over S, we get a number, and the operator now becomes, uh, uh, it's just this number or multiplying by this number. So, okay, so this is this thing. So now this H acts on F. I will maybe not, um, uh, so one can write down formally what uh, the action on F, of H on F is, but let me just uh, say it, uh, uh, informally in a moment. So uh, what we get is an irreducible representation of the Heisenberg algebra on this f. So irreducible operation means that if we say start with the basis of the cohomology of S and apply all creation operators to it and apply this to the element one in the zeroth cohomology 
of the Hilbert scheme of zero points on S. After all, the Hilbert scheme of zero points on S is a point, so it has only this one. If we apply all the creation operators to this, we get the canonical basis of F. So we get a canonical basis of the cohomology of all Hilbert schemes. So this is uh, what one gets by this. And so <clears throat> informally, uh, what this thing does is the following. Assume these uh, cohomology classes uh, that we have, uh, that we apply these operators to uh, on the surface are the, again, cohomology classes of submanifolds. <clears throat> then if I apply all these operators and apply them to the one, this is a cohomology class of the Hilbert scheme of N1 plus NR points on S. And what is it? We take the set of all subschemes in S, which are concentrated in not N, but R points on S. And each of these subschemes is a fat point of multiplicity Ni, which uh, can vary in the manifold Ai. So we take the set of all subschemes which are of this form, we take its closure in the Hilbert scheme, and this thing, the cohomology class of this, will be this. So we have a kind of geometric interpretation of this, and uh, so <clears throat> it's really uh, a nice way to describe uh, a basis of the Hilbert scheme of points, and it is, uh, it is nicely behaved, one can compute intersection products and so on. Anyway, so um, now just to go on a little bit. So if you have a Heisenberg algebra, I mean, I don't know whether you know, you might not have heard about it, but the a standard fact, if you have a Heisenberg algebra, there's a standard construction which constructs a Virasova algebra out of it. And so uh, Manfred Lane has shown that this standard, if you apply this standard construction to, uh, of the Virasova algebra to this situation, then this Virasov algebra also has a geometric meaning on the Hilbert scheme of points. And in fact, it basically, it is what governs the ring structure of the Hilbert, of the cohomology rings of the Hilbert schemes of points. So it has a very nice thing. And then um, there are further uh, developments. Uh, Carlson and Oponkov uh, showed that, you know, if you're in this situation, if you have this Heisenberg algebra, you can also find something which is called vertex operators, which is even more complicated. And even this have a geometric meaning in, in terms of uh, uh, tautological chiefs and things like that. So it's, um, <clears throat> uh, so all these uh, uh, kind of abstract constructions in terms of infinity dimensional uh, the algebras have geometric meaning. And uh, so they can be used to study the Hilbert scheme and also the other round to study uh, uh, such algebras in terms of the Hilbert scheme. Okay, so this was enough about uh, these Betty numbers and their application. Uh -huh. So I'm a bit considerably slower than I thought, so you, you will <laughs> only see some part. So now I want to briefly, very briefly talk about Hilbert schemes of points. So uh, just briefly, I remind you uh, informally of churn classes of vector bundles. So if we have a vector bundle on a projective variety, it has so-called churn classes. These are classes CI of V, which lie in the two ith cohomology of X. And we can define the total churn class as the sum of all uh, these churn classes. And this definition doesn't, if X is smooth, this definition doesn't only make sense for vector bundles, we can also replace the vector bundle by a coherent sheet. So, which would be like a vector bundle with singularities. Um, and one of the main properties is that if you have an exact sequence of vector bundles or sheaves, then the total churn class of the term in the middle is the product of uh, the ones on the side. So we have this nice multiplicative. So this is all very standard. Uh, <clears throat> so these churn classes, you know, are a little bit complicated to define, but um, they measure how far our vector bundle is from being trivial, just being O to the R. For instance, if L is the line bundle associated to a divisor, then the first churn class will just be uh, the, the cohomology class of that divisor. So that means you have a line bundle 
which has a section which vanishes along a, a device, a one, a one four dimensional complex, uh, one four dimensional sub variety, then the first join class is a class of that device. Now, for if S is a surface and Z is a point in the Hilbert scheme of endpoints, then the first churn class of the ideal sheet will be zero, and the second churn class will be this number n. So that means uh, we, after all, we do have Poincare duality, which says that the fourth homology of S is just set. set. So under this isomorphism, the second churn class is just n, the number of points. Otherwise, uh, you know, so it's kind of the, cla the class of uh, this subscheme, but the class of this subscheme is just uh, given by the number of points. Okay. Um, we also have the churn classes of X, which are just defined to be the churn classes of the tangent bundle of X. So, for instance, the first churn class of X is just minus the canonical class, where uh, the canonical class is the class associated, or the canonical line bundle is the bundle associated to a holomorphic n form on a variety of dimension n of the two. <clears throat> so, so if x is, in addition, if x is smooth and compact of dimension d, then its uh, topological Euler characteristic, so the alternating sum of the Betty numbers, is the evaluation on x that we had before of the top churn class of X, which is sometimes called the Hopf index theorem. So <clears throat> anyway, so these are all standard facts about churn class. So now let's look at uh, uh, the model of space of sheets. I just want to say a few things. So let S be a surface, H an ample line bundle on S. And uh, we want a space that parameterizes the coherent sheaves on S with fixed numerical invariants, say with fixed churn classes. So <clears throat> Such a space will not exist, at least not as a projective scheme, but uh, we need somehow that the sheaves cannot be too big. And uh, what we really need is that the sheaves uh, should not have too big subsheaves. So this uh, says that the sheaves are semi stable. So the precise definition is the following. So a torsion free coherent sheaf, if you want, you can think of a vector bundle, is called semi stable with respect to our ample line bundle O of 1. If if I take the dimension of the space of section of uh, <clears throat> of a subsheaf f of e tenderized with O of n divided by the rank of f, this is always smaller than the corresponding thing for our e. So the subsheaves of f are not too big in the sense that the twists don't have too many sections. And this is something which is necessary to have a nice uh, space parameterizing that. This should be true for all subspace f and whenever uh, n is large. So the sheaf will be called stable if this inequality here is always strict. So if it's always small. So then one can show there exists a modelized space of semi stable coherent sheaves. Uh, with respect to the H of uh, rank R, this churn class is C1, C2 on our surface. Um, and in fact, uh, as an open subset, it has the modular space of stable sheaves. And in many cases, depending on the churn classes we have here, stable is the same as semi stable, uh, then the modular space is particularly nice. Now, if we uh, we can identify the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S with the modelized space of sheaves on S by sending a subscheme to its ideal sheet. So if you have a subscheme Z uh, of length n, its ideal sheet will be sheaf of rank one, this first churn class zero, and second churn class n. And in fact, all uh, uh, subsheaves with, with all sheaves with these churn classes are of this form. In fact, the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on S is isomorphic to this modular space of sheaves. So we can also view it as a special case of modular spaces of sheaves, kind of the simplest example. Um, so <clears throat> now in higher rank, uh, there are several connections that Hilbert schemes have to um, modular space of sheaves. I just list uh, without very many proofs. Uh, but this 
the modular space of sheaves in rank R will depend on the emperor class H via uh, some kind of wall crossing. So we have seen that stability is defined in terms of H, and so it will depend somehow on H. But it doesn't depend kind of a completely random way on it. It doesn't jump around randomly. What actually happens to be the case is that, say we restrict to the case that the rank is two, um, there will be some class Xi in the second cohomology of S, which give hyperplanes. So these are just the classes which are orthogonal to them. That means if I multiply uh, an element in the second cohomology with Xi, uh, then uh, the class orthogonal are those such that the product is zero. Uh, so, so, I, so this defines some walls, and this modular space will be constant in the complement of the walls, and it changes whenever H crosses a wall. So we have this kind of picture. This is the second cohomology with R coefficients as a vector space. There is this orthogonal space to our uh, class, and then we have the H minus where um, the intersection with xi is negative, and this, and the moduli space will be the same on this side, will be the same on this side, but it changes when you cross this wall. Actually, what happens is that if you have a sheaf, which is an extension of an of two ideal sheaves tensorized by line bundles uh, with each other, um, such that the difference of the first joint classes of these are, is xi, then when you recross the wall, extensions of this form, or the projective space of extensions of this form will be replaced by the space of extensions where I replace the role, of, you know, where I take the extensions the other around. So IW tends to be goes to E goes to uh, this. And so we have a simple surgery which changes the modelized space to each other. And so this can be used to study uh, the modelized spaces uh, and to understand uh, about the invariants. There's a more general result, which is uh, uh, more difficult to understand why it should be true. So <clears throat> if we look at the modelized spaces of sheaves on a surface, this will in general be very singular and we cannot really talk well about homology and Poincare duality, but there's a kind of virtual version of it, which, has, which is in terms of some virtual fundamental class, whatever that means. So you have some kind of virtual kind of way of doing this homological computations. And so if we compute some, in this virtual sense, some intersection numbers of cohomology classes on this modelized space, there is a formula which relates this uh, number to a kind of intersection number of tautological bundles and so on, on a product of Hilbert schemes. So that means every question, every number we want to compute on the modelized space of sheaves on the surface, we can compute on Hilbert schemes of points. So in some sense, every nice question about Hilbert, of, about modelized spaces can be reduced to a question about Hilbert schemes. So that's also the reason why the Hilbert schemes are important. But the formula uh, is quite complicated and also difficult to use, so I will not uh, say more about it. But uh, this plays a role, for instance, in computation for the uh, buffer Witten invariant. So it might be that uh, Mata and Cole will talk about it. I don't know. OK. So um, now I want to talk about some, you know, some cases when uh, when the Hilbert scheme of points is a particularly nice space, and this plays a role in the applications. So, <clears throat> so maybe first I can say that um, so so a very important invariant of a complex of an algebraic variety, of a smooth algebraic variety is a canonical class. So that's the, um, or the canonical line bundle. That's the bundle of holomorphic n forms if n has dimension n. It has two dimension two n is uh, holomorphic two n forms. So for instance, if we take the n-fold product of S, if we take the symmetric product of S, this is singular, but it's uh, reasonably close to being smooth. And we have the quotient map from the n fold product of S to the symmetric power, dividing by the action of the symmetric group. So we have this quotient map. And one can show that the canonical line bundle on the symmetric product pulls back to the canonical line bundle on the 
uh, on the end full product. Uh, outside of co dimension two, so that means could, so in the Hilbert scheme, uh, the locus where more than two points come together has co dimension uh, at least two. So outside co dimension two, uh, we have seen that the Hilbert scheme of n points on S is just the Hilbert, the blow up of the semantic power along the locus uh, where just two points come together. And we know that over this locus, the semantic power has a quadratic, you know, has a kind of uh, quadratic cone singularities. And uh, it is a standard fact that if you blow up a quadratic, uh, these quadratic cone singularities, the canonical bundle does not change. So you have that the canonical bundle of the Hilbert scheme is just the pullback of the canonical bundle of the semantic power. Because for the canonical bundle, what happens in co dimension bigger than two is irrelevant. Um, <clears throat> so, in particular, if S is a K3 surface, that's a quart, for instance, a quartic in P3, so a zero set of polynomial degree four in P3, which is smooth, then we know that the canonical line bundle is trivial. So, every uh, there are everywhere non-vanishing holomorphic two forms on S. So we get from this that the canonical class on the Hilbert scheme of n points on S is also trivial. It's also a trivial bundle. In fact, something much stronger is true. S is uh, in, in the Hilbert scheme of n points on S, not S, is an irreducible holomorphic symplectic manifold or hyperkähler manifold. So let me briefly say what this is. So if X is a smooth projective variety of uh, dimension 2n. That's called hyperkähler or irreducible holomorphic symplectic. If there is an is a unique everywhere non-degenerate holomorphic two form omega. So what does it so what does it mean it's everywhere non-degenerate? It means that if we batch it with itself uh, n times, then uh, we have an, a two n form on this two n dimensional manifold. So it's a section of the canonical class. And this 2n form vanishes nowhere. So in particular, the canonical line bundle is trivial, but it's much stronger than the canonical bundle just being trivial. So hyperkähler varieties are very special and very rare and have a very rich structure. So uh, there's a lot of things one can do with them. <clears throat> so for instance, well, if the dimension of X is two, then actually the hyperkähler varieties are precisely the K3 surfaces. So, uh, and now uh, the fact is, <clears throat> so as I said, the hyperkähler varieties have this very rich structure. So one thing that you have, for instance, is the uh, oville bogomolov quadratic form on the second cohomology. So that means we have a quadratic form so we can multiply uh, two elements in the second cohomology with each other and get a number. Um, and it's done in such a way that if we take this, um, uh, this uh, class in the second cohomology and multiply it instead, multiply it with itself two n times and uh, evaluate it on x, this should be a number. This actually can be expressed in a kind of, uh, in a unique, in a, a uniform way in terms of this quadratic form for all classes in the second homology. So we can uh, understand, uh, okay, so that's one thing. And in fact, many things can be expressed in terms of this Bouville Bogomelov quadratic form. For instance, you can um, express uh, the holomorphic Euler so the Riemann Roch formula in terms of this quadratic form and so on. And uh, <clears throat> in addition, you could say that Q is, you know, have a quadratic form on the second cohomology that is like the quadratic form you have on the second cohomology on the K of, of a K3 surface. You know, you multiply classes in the second cohomology on the K3 surface with itself, you get to the fourth one, and then by Frank duality you get a number. So Q behaves very similar to that. So in some sense, a little bit morally hyperkähler variety, although they have a very high dimension, behave a little bit as if they were surfaces. And uh, <clears throat> this quadratic form in, in, encodes much of the ge geometry of X and makes them very special and very interesting. And so they also play uh, play a role in physics in conformal field theory and so on. So, <clears throat> so anyway, 
Bouville shows that F is a K, if S is a KC surface, then the Hilbert scheme of endpoints is hyperkähler. So I had already kind of hinted to you why the canonical bundle is trivial, but it's actually hyperkähler. Uh, Mukai proves more generally that if S is a K surface, then any modelized space of sheaves on uh, this KT surface uh, is also hyperkähler, provided that uh, yeah that it only consists of stable points. So that's a numer numerical condition on the churn classes, but in that case, it's also hyperkähler. Otherwise. Uh, if stable is not equal to semi-stable, the modelized space will usually be singular, and that is uh, not allowed for hyperkähler. So that's the main point. And uh, Mongen, and then Holbrechts and Yoshioka show that if S is a KC surface, then somehow these two things are the same. If uh, we have modelized spaces of sheaves on a K3 surface, which are uh, where stable is equal to semi-stable, so where all the semi-stable points are stable, then it actually is deformation equivalent to the Hilbert scheme of endpoints of the same dimension. Now, the Hilbert scheme of endpoints has dimension to n, and this should be equal to the dimension of the modelized space, which happens to be this number. <clears throat> um, and so that means, in particular, that so deformation equivalent means you have a kind of uh, smooth uh, manifold such that uh, you have, uh, which is fibered over some other manifold, one fiber is the Hilbert scheme of points on a KT surface, another fiber is the uh, uh, modelized space of sheaves. And so they, it makes them very closely related and many uh, things can be compared. So <clears throat> this will then imply by kind of standard methods that for KT surface often results for modelized space of sheaves follow from the case of Hilbert schemes. So once I can prove something for Hilbert schemes, I know it for all modular space of sheaves by deformation and sometimes using also the bouville bogomolic quadratic form. So that's an interesting. So, okay. So now I wanted to briefly talk about another topic, which is universality. So I had into, so the thing is <clears throat> you want to compute some intersection numbers on Hilbert schemes, and uh, you would get some like to get some formulas for that. And so, um, you know, obviously you have the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on some surface S, you get the formula, you have the Hilbert scheme of endpoints on some other surface uh, X, you get some other formula, and if all these formulas have nothing to do with each other, so that's not so nice. So um, we want to kind of wait, wait to get some kind of uniform formulas and, uh, <clears throat> To have to see how all these things are related. And the first hint that such a thing might be possible is uh, that we see that the Hilbert schemes of points for different n are very closely related. You just can do the following. You see, if you have a point on the surface and a subscheme of length n, you get a subscheme of length n plus one by taking the disjoint union of the point and the subscheme of length n. That's trivial. Well, this almost always works, namely, if this point lies inside the subscheme, you don't know what to do. So that means you have a rational map from S times the Hilbert scheme of n points to the Hilbert scheme of n plus one points. Doing this. And this map is precisely not defined when the point lies in the subscheme, so on the universal subscheme. So we have a rational map from S to the Hilbert scheme of n points to the Hilbert scheme of n plus one points, which is not defined at the Hilbert scheme of at the universal family. So indeed, one can show, and that's actually not so difficult, but uh, that if you blow up this product S times Hilbert S along this singular subscheme Z and S, so you take the blow up, so that means every point here in Z and S is replaced by the productivization of the normal bundle of uh, the subscheme in this, of the fiber of the normal bundle of this, in this thing. Um, so if you do this, you get something which is smooth and such that this, on from the blow up to, uh, on the blow up, the map is defined. So one can resolve the indeterminacy of this map by blowing up along the Hilbert scheme of 
endpoints. In fact, one can show the following. If we take the blow up of S times Hilburn S along the universal family, we get another nice incidence correspondence. Sn n plus one, which is just the incidence correspondence of subschemes of length n and subschemes of length n plus one, where the smaller subscheme of length n is contained in the bigger one. Okay, so obviously, you, you know, if you, for instance, here it's kind of obvious if you now assume that this point does not lie in the subscheme, then the subscheme of length n plus one is just the union, and uh, you know, and the subscheme of length n is the z. So in that case, it's clear, but the, this thing can be extended to the whole. Okay, so this is what we have, and this allows us to compute intersection numbers on the Hilp, in this Hilbert scheme recursively. Remember, we had this tautological vector bundles on the Hilbert scheme, and we have also the churn classes of the tangent bundle. So assume we have any polynomial in these churn classes of the tautological bundles and the tangent bundle on the Hilbert scheme of endpoints. So <clears throat> cohomology can be pulled back. So we can take this cohomology class and pull it back to this incidence variety, Sn n plus one. Now, so now, now we are here on the scheme endpoints, we pull it back to S n, mi n minus one n. Okay, so we pull it back from the Hilbert scheme of endpoints to S n minus one n. And now uh, we know that S n minus one n is the blow up of S times Hilp n minus one S along the universal family here. So we have a map to this and we can push forward this cohomology class via this map. Now, obviously this is a little bit more complicated, but one can do this. And <clears throat> so as this map uh, uh, has degree n, so we get a class in the cohomology of the uh, Hilbert scheme in this product, such that, the, uh, that if we evaluate this on this product, it's the same is the evaluation of the original class multiplied by n. This is because uh, the <clears throat> uh, you know this S n n plus one has degree n over the you know, S n minus one n has degree n over the Hilbert scheme. You no, know, it, it over a general point of the Hilbert scheme there are n points of this thing. Okay, now we can kind of continue. We take this class uh, that we have here, we pull it back, you know, well, actually this was wrong. So to S n minus two n minus one times S and we push it forward to this factor. And then we keep on always pulling back this factor here and leaving the S itself and Go on until finally we are just on s to the we have just a cohomology class on s to the two on s to the n, and by the construction the integral over s to the n of this class is n factorial times the original. So this is the situation. So it's a bit complicated, and I haven't given you the details. But the thing is, one can understand what happens when one pushes forward via a blow up. You, there's some kind of mechanism which one can find in Fulton's book in terms of Sega classes of subschemes, whatever. So you can precisely say, see what ingredients go into the computation and you can work with it. It is incredibly complicated what goes into it, but you can precisely control what goes into it. And so at each step in this procedure, you know what the new terms are that enter the calculation and how uh, the ones that we have there before, how they change. And so this gives us some kind of recursion formula, compute any intersection number of the kind I said here on the Hilbert scheme. So we take this <clears throat> uh, and this recursion is uh, very complicated, so it cannot be solved explicitly, but one can control what the ingredients are. And in the end, after all, one adds up on S to the, on the n-fold product of S, so there are not so many classes there. And so, what one finally gets is the following. So if we have these tautological sheaves that I had been talking about, and assume we have any polynomial 
in the churn classes of, so first it's the polynomial in some variables, but we put in the churn classes of the tautological sheaf and the churn classes of the tangent bundle of the Hewitt scheme of points. So we can take this polynomial uh, and evaluate it on these classes. This is as it gives us a cohomology class. So this is in the homology of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints in S. So I use here the wrong notation. So this is, I call this P of Hilp and S dn. So we take this polynomial and we, we, we evaluate it on the joint classes of the tangent bundle of the Hilbert scheme and on the tautological classes. So then the, this recursion formula will tell you that there is, is a univers universality. So there is a polynomial Q in five variables, which depends only on the rank R of our bundle B and on the polynomial P we had here, such that in, independent of what S is and what V is, otherwise this evaluation of this cohomology class on the Hilbert scheme is this polynomial in terms of the churn classes of V and the churn classes of S. So we take C1 of V squared, C2 of V, C1 of V, C1 of S, C1 of S squared, C2 of S, we take this polynomial, and then for all surfaces and all vector bundles, the answer to our question is this. So it's a universal formula. We don't know what the formula is, but there is a universal formula which does it for all. And there's one more thing, namely these polynomials are not kind of random. So assume now, we are given such polynomials for all n. So for the Hilbert scheme of n points, we are given for each of them, we're given a polynomial. And assume we have the following. So one should think of the following. If we take the Hilbert scheme of n points on the disjoint union of two surfaces, what is it? It's the disjoint union over all n1 plus n2 equal to n, the Hilbert scheme of n1 points on s1, and the Hilbert scheme of n2 points on s2. Because what is a subscheme of n of length n on a disjoint union of two surfaces? It's a subscheme of one and a subscheme of on the other, such that this the length of the two subschemes length uh, add up to n, and this is just this. So it's this simple thing. So if we have this polynomial on s, if we want to ever elevate it on the Hilbert scheme of n points on s where S is a disjoint union of two surfaces, then uh, assume we have the following. If uh, we take this thing on this disjoint union, restrict it to one of these components here, Hilbert scheme of N1 points on S1, the Hilbert scheme of N2 points on S2, that then it is just applying the polynomial for N1 on S1 and the restriction of V to S1 and for uh, uh, S2, the corresponding polynomial for N2. So if we have this property that this identity holds, uh, then something nice will happen, which I'll show you in a moment. And the thing is that whenever you, this is not some crazy condition, whenever you are not stupid and write down uh, a reasonable set of such polynomials, this will always be true. If you have a natural way to write down these PNs, this will always be true. This is not some crazy condition. It's a kind of obvious thing that will always be true unless you, you know, do something stupid. Uh, then it will follow by looking at it carefully that I can write down the generating function of these, of the evaluating or evaluation of these polynomials on the Hilbert scheme. And this is now given by five, is just a product of five universal power series. So we have five power series. Uh, uh, in one variable, one to the power, uh, so to the powers of these uh, churn uh, numbers that we were using before. I here write something else, chi of s in terms, this can also be expressed in terms of uh, c2 of s and c1 of s, but, you know, after all, ks squared is the same as c1 of s squared. Uh, anyway, so we have five universal power series, we take them to the power, uh, the churn numbers of V and of S, and, uh, <clears throat> and then this gives me the generating function for these invariants. So, <clears throat> so that means the generating, so we can always find for all kinds of reasonable invariants uh, on the Hilbert schemes, 
we can find nice generating functions with satisfy product formula. Uh, <clears throat> and so one should think of this as the following. So this, we have this uh, multiplicativity that we have this multiplicative uh, functions and we have the universality that there is a kind of universal uh, formula like this. So these two properties allow us to compute uh, invariance on the Hilbert scheme of points by just looking at a few special cases. We just need enough special cases to be able to determine these five power series. We don't need to compute for all surfaces and for all vector bundles, but just for a few. And uh, this allows, for instance, to use localization and other things. But now I think, um, I think my time has expired. So <laughs> maybe it is uh, the moment to stop. So I, uh, I had uh, uh, one more application to counting of curves and uh, one more uh, method of computing, which is localization. But I don't think I, it makes sense to try to go there. I just anyway uh, give you an overview over things. So it's maybe a good moment to stop here. Under, uh, okay.